This is David's interview. Take one. Hi, my name is David, and my life has been impacted by... My wife and I, we were in Chicago this summer as part of our family vacation, and we went back, went back to Chicago because we have friends that are family back there, and that's where we moved up from to be able to come to the Central Valley. So it was a great time, but, but while we were there, we tried to eat our way through Chicago. We saw all the things that you could possibly see there, but we also, we wanted to make sure that we tried to catch a Cincinnati Reds game because it is God's team and it is God's sport, so you got to make sure you do both of those things. So... Um, we, we, and, and lucky enough, they were playing the Milwaukee Brewers up in Milwaukee. And so we decided to take a day and make a day trip of it. We went up to Milwaukee to watch the game. Uh, got there early to make sure we had some, you know, some, some normal Wisconsin fare. So we ate cheese curds like all day. That was basically what we did. But we also got a chance. We were looking for fun things to do. We, we actually went to the Cheesehead Museum, or the, the, the factory, okay? Cheesehead, we saw where all the cheeseheads are made. Now, this is a defective one because it's not the right color or orange, but I'm cheap, and so I got it, right? So we saw the cheese head play. It was fantastic. Now, I've got another one that I got. I'll bring it out another time, but uh, anyway, it's really cool, too. So uh, cheese head, then we went to the baseball game, and if you ever have a chance to go to the, the, the park in Milwaukee, it's awesome. Super cool place. They got great stuff for kids in the concourse. You could play games like the speed pitch and the accuracy. You can hit baseballs or wiffle balls and stuff like that. It's super fun. Uh, so Sheree and I, that's my wife, Sheree and I, we were, we were standing off to the side as Aniston and Easton were kind of like doing the games and just having a good time. So while we, I was watching, we were kind of watching Easton hit off of this tee and basically try to break like somebody's face with a ball. He just was, ah, like, I don't know. He was like that kid, you know. So he was, he was doing that. And, and as he was doing, I kind of, I, and I was watching Aniston, and I, and I, I kind of leaned back and I was kind of talking to Sheree. And I was like, you know, just a sweet moment. I'm like, oh, gosh, you who, who, what do you think it's going to be like when they get married? Like, who do you think they're going to get married to? And where do, you, where do you think they'll live? And will we move there? And it was just like this, just, you know, really fun conversation with her, just about the future and what it might, might look like. And, and Cherie was quiet. She's normally quiet. She's a very introverted person, but uh, she's very quiet. So I decided I was going to kind of turn and look to see how she was reacting to this little cute story that I was kind of telling and kind of painting. Except when I turned to look at Cherie, I noticed that Cherie was actually over there um, watching, <laughs> watching Aniston throw a ball at the target. <sighs> and it was in that moment that I realized that this cute conversation I was having with my little snookum Cherie about our kids and where we're going, all this stuff, was with a perfect stranger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And so as I looked at this woman next to me, uh, she was fairly taken back, wondering if she had kids she didn't know about, probably number one, you know, but, uh, but at the same time, just wondering, like, how could this possibly be happening to her right now? And I'm telling you, it probably was a couple of seconds of time, but it really felt like an eternity of awkward years. Anybody felt that before online? Yeah, you're, like, you're like, this is never going to end. You're sweating in places. You didn't even know you had glands. You're like, what is happening, you know? So needless to say, Cherie, um, she was, was both amused and, and then also relieved to know that I was not hitting on another woman, number one, okay, and that now she had a story to hold over my head for the rest of my life, okay? Now, I say that to you for a couple of reasons. One is to take the wick out of the blackmail bomb that my wife now has on me, because now everybody knows about it. But the second thing is to kind of just kind of dovetail it and introduce this last week of our series, which is called Conversations, um, because we've been talking about how we can learn to talk to somebody about Jesus in a way that is not weird and awkward at a Milwaukee Brewers game, uh, but that you can actually have a conversation with somebody about Jesus that's just really natural. And if you missed any of those weeks, or maybe this is your first time joining us here today, don't worry, I'm going to catch you up to speed really quickly. Uh, but I want you to let you know that we've made this, try to make it really simple. That if you are out with a friend and they're like, gosh, how do I share my faith with somebody? You could like take out a napkin and write down this acronym and explain it very quickly on how you could do it and you can do it as well. And this acronym we've been using is TALK. And TALK stands for, the T stands for, for to think about your one. Think about your one, that's the one person God might have put in your life to share a relation, to share Jesus with and share life with. 
Then A is ask questions. Just ask them questions about their life. Get to know them on a relational level. Um, L stands for lead with your story. That's your story of how you met Jesus. And you learn that by answering three questions. Who was I before Jesus? How did I meet Jesus? And what's my life like after Jesus? And so those are interesting. Now, if you missed any of those weeks, these first three weeks, if you missed any of them, you can go back online, check those out on our website. You can go to our free Crossroads Grace app. You can watch all those there. In fact, online, would you mind doing that for me right now? Put both of those links in and you can check those out in a little bit. But, but here's the deal. In some cases, right, all three of these right here, like all three of these, like it could happen overnight. You might know the person right away. You might have already asked them a bunch of questions to get to know them. You may even have told your story so many times they know your testimony better than you. And so if that's you, that's great. You're a unicorn, but that's great because that's not how it is for most people because most of us, it takes a while. These first three stages of this, of this talk analogy could take days or weeks or months or years. You don't even know how long, and that's okay too. You might have relationships where it just happens naturally, and you might have relationships where you have a little time and there's some tending that's needed to it. But the key is to remember that your one is a person, not a project. I'll say that again. Your one is a person, not a project. We want to have a conversation with them because we genuinely care about them as a person. But now, what do we do when we get to the, the K, right? What do we do when we get to the K? And the K stands for... Uh, keep Jesus involved. Because the next one, that's a big one, isn't it? it, it it's a big one. And it, it is why many of us kind of stop right here. We kind of stop right there because the next step is to share the gospel of Jesus with someone and invite them to actually follow Jesus too. Yikes, right? I mean, we're like all getting like sweaty palms here right now, right? Anybody feel like me at the Reds game? You're like, I don't know, man. I don't know about this. Because here is what we start to think when it comes to this. We start thinking, I just worked so hard to build this relationship with this person, and I think we're kind of friends now. But if I share Jesus with them, I'm going to lose this whole thing. Like, this could backfire on me, and I'm not sure I can handle that. You know, may, maybe I'll just wait. Yeah, 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 I'll just wait. I'll let, I'll let somebody else do it, because they're probably more spiritual than I am. Or maybe, what if I do this? What if we just become really good friends, and I never go to that next Jesus level with them? What if I just do that? Now, who's willing to, like, be honest enough to say, like, I've thought that before. Like, I've kind of done that before. I, I think we all kind of have. And, and maybe for good reason. I mean, maybe asking, maybe when you ask somebody to follow Jesus, maybe it, it backfired and you were lost that relationship. Maybe you've seen people laugh in your face or make fun of you because of what you believe. Maybe you've even had family members that kind of pulled away after you've kind of told people what you believe. And and all that's hard. It is all 100% hard. So is, it, so is it really important that we do that, knowing that that's what's at risk? Is it really that important? Does it really matter for me to do that? Well, well I think it's important to be very clear on why this actually does matter and why it is important for us to take that next step. So today what I want to do is I want to give us five real reasons why keeping Jesus involved matters. Five real reasons G keeping Jesus involved matters. But as I was putting together this message, I, I felt like God, like, tapping me on the soul. Have you ever had God do that? Just, like, ugh, like tap you on the soul? And, and he, he was telling me this. He says, hey, let them hear from me. In, in other words, Pastor B, Brian, get out of the way. Like, just move out of the way and just let me talk to them. And what I believe he meant by that is he wanted his word to do the work. So, so, so that as we wrap our heads around why keeping Jesus involved is important, that God is saying, hey, I want you to know my reason for it much more than your reason, Brian. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to let God's word give you the justification why these five reasons are very, very important. Because I can rest them in his capable hands and it always works. So... All right, so, so if you have your Crossroads Grace apps with you today, this would be a great time to open those up because I'm going to go through a lot of scripture today. You can take notes right in the app. It's a great thing for you. Or you can follow along, whatever easiest for you. But today, let me give you the five reasons why it's very important to keep Jesus involved. And the first reason to keep Jesus involved is this. Sin is real. I just said the S word, didn't I? Mm-hmm, yeah, I just said it. I said it, right? 
But I've come to realize that although we might get easy queasy about this, I realize, I've come to realize that whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian, and you could be both in the room here today or both joining us online, I agree, right? Deep down, whether you're a Christian or not, you know this is true. You know it's true. Because we can look in the world that we're in that is an absolute dumpster fire crumbling all around us, We can see people like my friend Jordan who is battling through cancer right now because of the broken world that we live in. You can see people that are hurt and they're hurting and all kinds of things happen and you inherently know it's not right. You can look at it and say it's not right. We we can see things that we look at and we can say "There there is something better than that right now. There is. And that dissonance between what we know is right and what is happening proves to us that sin is real. Because sin is a fracture to the right, good, and true way that God designed the world from the very beginning. It's just how it is. And we read from the very beginning what sin actually did. And we read in Genesis chapter 6, as we're kind of talking about Noah and the flood, it says that now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the world had be- the earth had become for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. And that corruption that we just talked about is what is is what the is not just that it broke what was right but it actually broke not just cultural and the moral part of us and created a gap but it actually created a spiritual gap between us and God. And you should know that none of us are immune from that. None of us are immune from that. Paul would tell us in Romans 3:23. He says it clearly. He says For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I did a little favor for you. I did a deep dive in the Greek word for all. And what all actually means is all, like everybody, right? It's just, it's all. Like we have all done it. And because we have all sinned, we have all fallen away from God, which which God says there's a punishment that's there. And and the punishment is that we should be separated from him forever by, by death. Again, Romans 6, 23, Paul would say it this way. He says, for the wages of sin is death. So what this says is that we all sin and that all sin has separated us from God and that we all deserve to die because of that sin. That's what it is. But we also realize something, that death is a reality for all of us. Ain't none of us going to come out of this thing alive, just so you know. And that leads us to the second thing we need to know it's real. Not only is sin real, but eternity is real. Sin is real, eternity is real. And we often live our life without ever considering what happens when this life is over. We do. I mean, after all, we only got one life to live, man. Let's go for it. But when this life is over, we will face eternity. And that eternity will either be with God or it will be without God. And the choice, I'm telling you, the choice is ours. Choice is ours. Um, Jesus says this in John chapter 5. He says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. So this means that, that the decision we make about Jesus in this life will tell us what happens in our next life. And there will be only one of two types of eternity. Jesus tells us again, Matthew chapter 5, he'll say that then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So the reality is, is that there is a righteous, eternal life that is offered by God and that there is also a a life that is apart from God forever that's also also available. So eternity is is very real. But before you think, man, you're going a little bit too far down the road here. This is the heavy stuff, Pastor B. Can we just get to the light stuff? Hang on, just relax. Okay, we got to talk a little bit. There is some good news. And that news begins with the third reason that keeping Jesus involves matters, and it's this. <laughs> Jesus is real, right? Sin is real, eternity is real, but Jesus is real. And this is where the turn to hope happens, y'all. It's that God didn't leave us in the mess of our sin, but he chose to send his one and only son from heaven to earth so that he could be the hope for the entire world. To, to, to make a way for our sins that should lead us to death, but instead he can lead us towards the path of eternal life with him. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 4 so beautifully. He says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. And although Jesus came as a baby, that's what we celebrate at Christmas. We already got our Christmas service plan. We're super pumped about it. Baby Jesus, going to be awesome. But he grew to be a man. And he lived his life perfectly. 
And only his perfect life could pay for the sins of our imperfect life. It's called atonement. He atoned for our sins. And because Jesus was perfect and he gave his life life up for us, he is the only way back to the Father. Which is why Jesus says this in John 14, 5. He says that Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So God sent Jesus to make a way out of the darkness of our sin and into the eternity with him to offer that to us. But we ultimately have to choose. We have the choice to choose him. God will never strong arm you into loving him. But he actually wants us to love Jesus. He wants us to want to love Jesus. And what he offers us through Jesus is actually the third reason keeping Jesus involved in our conversations is so important. And that is, is that grace is real. Grace is the undeserved gift that we all are offered through Jesus Christ. And and Paul said, if you remember, that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve death. But guess what? Instead of giving us what we deserve, he offers us grace, which we don't deserve. Mind-blowing. And it's this grace that actually saves us all. Ephesians chapter 2, we get to read about it. It says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So once we accept this gift of grace Jesus offers us, now all of a sudden we are inherently different. We are no longer sinners, but we are now sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords. It brings us from an eternity apart from God into an eternity with him always, all because of grace that we did not deserve. But now we get, because of Jesus, we can access the halls of heaven. As the writer of Hebrews says, oh, this is so beautiful. Listen, he says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Somebody needed that today. I'll tell you what, right now, right We are given access to the throne of grace by Jesus and Jesus alone who had mercy on us when we were lost and unable to find ourselves on our own. Which then leads us, though, to the the final thing which just blows your mind and still blows my mind today, and it's this. Salvation is real. Salvation is real. Right? You can clap for a little salvation here today. That's fine. Because of Jesus, we can be saved. We can have salvation. Our sin does not have to have the final word, Jesus can. And and even though it may look dark because of the sin in our life and in my life, Jesus still offers us grace and offers us salvation through him. Why? Because he loves us. Loves us. Listen to some of my favorite scripture in all the Bible. Hebrews chapter 9, speaking of Jesus, the writer says this, But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with the sin, with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now, and, and then listen, uh, and, and you know John 3.16, but there's a little bit more after that. You should take a look. John 3.16 it goes, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But check it out. 17 and 18 just fired. Look what it says. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So my friends, can you, can you see why it matters? Why does it matter to keep Jesus involved in our conversations? It matters because eternity is on the line. It matters because heaven and hell are real. It matters, because, it matters because Jesus died for us. It matters because life is short and eternity is long. And I'm not trying to be that kind of pastor that's trying to scare the hell out of you. Like, I'm not trying to do that. No, no, no. But I do want to make sure that I'm clear about why keeping Jesus involved in our conversations is important. I just need to make sure you know. But yet, why is it? Why is it that if we know all of that and we come to this line in the sand with our conversations with our people, 
And that if we step over that line, it's telling them about Jesus and offering them the chance for this eternal life that we know about. Why is it that we pull up short of stepping across that line? Let me, let me give you a bit of an illustration. Um, I mentioned my wife, Cherie, earlier. The sweetest thing, right? Sweetest thing. We're going to be married 19 years tomorrow. Okay, like that's like <laughs> crazy straws, right? I've told you before, she gives me, she, now she gives me annual one-up contracts, you know, so I have to ask the day before, I'm like, hey, do I get another year? And fortunately, we're still going. So 19, right? 19 and counting so far. But she's a sweet thing. She's, a, she's an introvert, though. She is behind the scenes. You will never see her on stage. You'll never see her preach. You'll never see her play the piano. You definitely won't hear her sing, okay? Right? Um, if you do see her, she's a unicorn. You'd be like, oh, it's Sheree, right? Exactly. It's, you're not going to see That's And I love her. She's got her own career. She's a nurse anesthetist, so she puts people to sleep and wakes them up for a living, right? She's wicked Yoda smart, smarter than I'll ever be in my entire life, and I love her, I love her, I love her. I love my Sheree. And, and, and again, but she's in the background. But Cherie is very interesting because the other day she was, uh, or a few, few months ago at this point, uh, my, my daughter plays travel volleyball, which is just crazy. There's many stories coming out of that. But travel volleyball. And one of the volleyball moms comes up to Cherie and says, hey, Cherie, um, and God's talking to her. She says, hey, listen, you, you need to watch this show on Netflix. And Cherie's like, well, you know, I'm kind of like watching show, you know, documentaries. She says, yeah, you have to watch this show. It's called, it's called Drive to Survive. And so Cherie's like, um, I don't know, maybe, you know, kind of thing. And so she's like, no, 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 you got to watch this show. Just give it a couple of episodes. Watch this show, and, and you're going you're, you're gonna to love this show. And she's like, okay, if, if it will leave, if you'll let you leave me alone, because I'm an introvert, I want to talk to you anyway, right? So she's like, hey, just, just watch the show. So Sheree's like, okay. So she watches the first show, and then she binge watches the next three seasons, okay, <laughs> until her eyes are bleeding out of her face. She watches this whole thing. And at the end of this epic moment, this journey, my wife, Sheree, is now addicted, straight on addicted, addicted to F1 Formula One racing, everybody, right? <laughs> Formula One racing. This is what my wife is addicted to. Crazy straws, deep and addicted to F1 racing. In fact, let me just let me just say, I, I'm going to say, my wife loves F1 racing so much, and then I want you to say, how much does she love it? Okay, the, everybody, you at home, I want to hear you, okay? Here we go. Ready? All right. My wife loves F1 racing so much <laughs> that she will get up at 6 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday before church to watch a Formula One race in Monaco. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. My wife loves F1 racing so much. Yeah, that when I got home one day, I had an Amazon package that had this in it, okay? My wife has a team now that she's rooting for, all right? And the crazy part is, is I like the other team, and so I'm pro Red Bull. And so now we're a divided home over F1 racing. My wife loves F1 racing so much that she now has recruited her friend from Chicago to get up at 6 a.m. and watch races online with her, and then they'll talk about it later, okay? <laughs> My wife knows about hard tires and soft tires and medium tires. She knows when they should put them on, when they should take them off. She knows about pit stops, how long they should be. She knows about DRS. She knows about qualifying. She knows who's in the first place. She knows about contractor's points. She knows everything, and now I know it too, right? This is insane, okay? My wife never, ever, she drives the speed limit. She does and she's watching F1 racing, okay? All because some crazy lady at volleyball says, hey, you should watch this show, and now my life is ruined, okay? Right? Right? All, but because what? And you laugh right now, men, you are playing golf courses right now because somebody said, you got to play this course. Am I right? Right? Ladies, you are on Pinterest because somebody said you can make that, right? You know, you, yeah, please somebody give me an amen for some Pinterest up in here. They never look the same, but you're trying, you know, right? Pinterest crack, you are on it and you cannot get off it, right? You know, why? Because somebody said you got to try it and you're like, okay, All right? And you went for it, right? It is evangelism of all kinds. So here's what's true, isn't it? This is true. This statement's true right here. We share about what we care about. Is that right? We share about what we care about. So what about this? You care about Jesus? 
Do you care about Jesus? And I mean it. Do you really care about Jesus? And if you say yes, if you say yes, then straight up, listen, if you say yes, then the world must know that you care about him. That we must share it with the world, especially, and it starts with our one. And, and, and listen, we, we got to. We just have to. And let me just say it this way. This is not just a pastor thing. right? Nobody gets a hall pass. Jesus has called all of us to tell the world about him. Students, listen to me. As you go back to your elementary school, your junior high, your high school, be bold in your faith. Would you care enough about your friends, not just to like their photos, but to love their soul? Would you do that? College students, as you get ready to go off to wherever you might be, maybe you're driving right now like my friend Deshaun, right? Like this may be the most important and influential time in your life. And those that are around you about Jesus, would you be bold? Would you talk about him? Mothers, would you make sure that when you have those times, those meet-up dates with your fellow moms as the kids are at school, that you talk about Jesus and not so much about how much your kids are driving you crazy all the time? Dads, listen to me. You listen to me. Don't you dare let the spiritual development of your kids be off, offset to your wife or to the church. You, you take it up. You share Jesus with your kids. You lead well in your home. Oh, and those people that might have a few extra years in their life that they've been going through, hello, right? You know who you are. Did you know that there is no retirement when it comes to sharing Jesus with other people? The mission is still going. you got a pulse. He's got a plan. Listen, and, and, and I get it. I get it that not everyone, not everyone's going to receive Jesus with open arms. Isn't new, though. It's not new. Paul, Paul would say this regarding this in the gospel, about the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen, he says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God, and is the wisdom of God. Just like the Jews and the Gentile, people want God their way. They want him their way. And, it's, and if it's not our way, that's when the gospel becomes a stumbling block. And just because it's a stumbling block doesn't mean we should stop placing it in front of people, though. In fact, it's why, even more than ever, that I would rather have them stumble over the gospel of Jesus than stumble over a cliff and die for all eternity. I'm just being honest with you today. See, people, Paul, excuse me, Paul would actually call us to an even stronger stance with this in the message about the gospel. If we look in Romans chapter 1, in Romans we read this. Let me say, actually, Romans up here. It says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God that brings it. Right? And why is this true? Because of what the author of Hebrews would later say in Hebrews chapter 2, where he says, it says, So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So guys, this means that if Jesus isn't ashamed of us, we shouldn't be ashamed of him. And if if you want to take anything away from this message today, if you get anything, I want you to remember this one thing, this one thing. There is nothing to be ashamed of in Jesus. There's nothing to be. But what we need to understand is that the reason people reject the message of Jesus is not because of you. It's actually not because of the gospel. They reject it because of themselves. They reject it because they have to, in order to receive it, they have to get past their sin and they have to get past their pride to be able to receive the salvation. And and the reason the gospel causes many to stumble is because it doesn't fit in to their understanding of what right and wrong is. Because we don't think people should ever lose. We don't think there should be a standard to live up to because the standard is relative in our world. And when God says that there is one way to eternity, and that's through Jesus Christ, when we read that there is a real heaven and a real hell hell on the line, when we hear that if you're not on the right side of Jesus after you die, you won't receive eternal life, when people hear all of that, it causes them to stumble because we want to believe that we are all good enough and that God's judgment is just not real. But this is why we must create opportunities and the right to be heard by having conversations with those people that we love, that God puts in our life. It's why we must gain the right to be heard more than ever before. It's why we must love the ones well. Because with eternity on the line, 
we must make sure that our conversations move from the superficial to the spiritual at some point. That if we really love that person, as much as I know you do, the greatest gift that you can ever give them is the gift of life through Jesus. You might have heard in business, there's this phrase, it's called the ABCs of business, always be closing. See, in conversations, I think it stands for always bring Christ. Always. So again, I ask you, why do we need to share Jesus? Because there's nothing, nothing to be ashamed of in Jesus. And you just never know what that conversation may do in someone's life. Just like in my friend David's life. In 2013, my wife and I came to Crossroads for the first time, and it was about a month later that there was a men's retreat, and I decided to go to the men's retreat, check out the men and, and see if they were the, the real deal, see if they were a bunch of um, legal, legalistic, Bible-thumping knuckleheads. And it was that weekend when I was so touched by the the, the love of the, the men for each other, the love of men for God and, and God's love for me, that really impacted my life. I realized that there was something that I was, that there was something I was missing. And after 23 years, um, I'd really been wrestling with the fact that I had missed what God had for me, that I as, as I'd wasted my life. I recommitted my life to the Lord and my life has just changed in such a way that there's, there's now a sense of purpose I've seen God work in me and through me. Yeah, over the last eight years, I've asked God to give me opportunities to, to share my faith. And for me, where I found that happen more often than not was out on the disc golf course. I like to play disc golf, and I usually go out by myself. And there were just many times where I'd be out playing disc golf, and all of a sudden there would be one other guy, and it's like, okay, maybe this is that divine opportunity to share with them that that God loves them and God has a plan for them. And, and there was one time in particular, I was out at New Hogan Reservoir and I was playing and about a third, halfway through the round, I crossed paths with this other guy named Terry. And Terry and I started playing together and we finished the round together. And I kept thinking that maybe I should share with, with Terry. And I was going back and forth and I didn't. Um, and, and part of that was because Terry and I had agreed to get together the next week and, and play again. So I assumed that I had more time. We became Facebook friends, and that week um, on Facebook, I saw that Terry posted that he had to unexpectedly go back to the Philippines, and he was leaving that following Sunday. So I reached out to him and messaged him that, hey, let's get together one last time because I didn't want to miss this opportunity I never heard back from him, so I showed up that next Saturday just hoping that he had gotten my message. I got out there and I waited and I waited and he wasn't there. So I was just about ready to tee off on hole one and a car comes into the parking lot and, and Terry gets out. And as he walks up, it's like, Terry, did you get my message? And he said, what message? He said, I just came out to play one last round. And it's like, man, okay, this, this is, uh, this is an opportunity just to share with him that, that God really loves him. So we, we played and then I asked him if I could go out, take him out to lunch. We went out to lunch and I really don't remember what I said and I, don't, I didn't feel like it was very much or very impactful. I remember sharing with him the, the, the love of God and what God had done for me. But about two weeks later, I saw Terry post on Facebook that he had been living in sin, that he had, um, had turned away from God. And he had met this guy named David out on a disc golf course who shared the love of Jesus with him. And he was just convicted by God to recommit his life to the Lord and to surrender to the Lord. I had no idea until two weeks later that I saw that. And then over the next several years in the Philippines, God used him to work among youth um, in a very, very poor area. And what that showed me was that God will use me and God will use others when we give him the opportunity, that we don't need to worry that we don't have enough knowledge, that we don't have the right words, that we don't have verses memorized. And there may be times where I never see the result, 
at some point in eternity, I'm gonna see the result. I'm constantly praying for opportunities like that, with, whether it's a do-over with Terry, that hey, I missed the opportunity, God give me a do-over, or for new opportunities with people to share with them the, the love of Jesus. We bring what little bit we have, and then God takes that and he, he multiplies it. And that really in, encouraged me, and that was about seven years ago, and that's encouraged me since then, and even in those times where it's like, ah, do I? That when I step out on faith, I see God using um, the, the words that I speak, and he takes those, and he does far more with them than, than I ever think he's going to and that I ever could. You really never know. You really never know. But as we kind of turn our hearts toward communion and we start to think about this, I just wonder how the series, maybe David's story, maybe just what we talked about today is, is resonating with people. And, and maybe there's some people out there that have never really thought that sin was real, eternity is real, love is real, grace is real, salvation is real. And maybe today you're like, I, well, I need that. I need Jesus. I need him in my life. I, I need him to take over this life of sin that I've got. And if that's you, I just want to tell you that we'll have pastors and directors available to pray with you. After service, they would love to do that. We'll pray in a second for you. But take that next step. For some of you, we're going to put a QR code up next to me that maybe you need to take a next step. We've got some really great resources for you. If you need to get baptized, if that's your next step, take a picture of this QR code. You'll have a chance to be able to sign up to get baptized. We'd love to take that, that step with you. Maybe like David, you want to go to the men's retreat, connect with some great guys, get some great people in your life. Men's retreat's coming up, and you can find out more information there. I'm going to be preaching there. We have a couple of our pastors preaching there. It's going to be a great time to connect. We'd love for you to join us there. We also have growth groups that are starting. Great way to get 8 to 10 people around and be able to live life with people. I'm telling you, those are some of the most powerful relationships I have, both now and here at Crossroads and, and, and before. They are some of my best friends. But it starts by getting in community. Whatever it might be, take a picture Go to that site and be able to walk into your next steps. And we want to be there for you. So we'll lead you to discover Jesus. And we want to help you follow him fully. But there's also a chance, I think, for everybody. We've got a series coming up in September, beginning of September. It's called Chosen. And I am just saying, this is a series you want to be a part of. You will want to invite your one to it. It is a, you are going to want to be here every week. It might be one of the most powerful series we have ever done in the history of this church. I'm, I'm as strong enough to be able to say that I believe that this is that important. Be a part of it. Invite your one. You will not be disappointed. Please come. Please invite some people. It's going to be awesome. But as we take communion here in a second, I want us to remember that it's all because of Jesus that it's possible. Not because of anything I've said, not because of anything anyone else has said. It's because of what we read in the Bible. What he just simply said that this is the truth. This is real. And we really want you to be a part of that. Jesus died on the cross for our sins in our place. So at communion, we remember that. And the bread that's on the top, that whether you're using at home or whatever you might be having here, this bread represents the bread of life of Jesus Christ. He broke his body, who gave up his life for us. We take it and eat, remembrance of Jesus now. Underneath there is the juice, and that juice represents the shed blood of Jesus. It reminds us of the pain and the the sacrifice that he went through so that we could have eternal life with him. So when Jesus was with his friends, he took a cup and he said, and when you're to get together, I want you to remember me through this, this act of remember me through this juice and this wine. So in this moment, remember Jesus, the sacrifice for us. We take and drink in remembrance of him. So my friends, what I'm going to ask you to do here in a second is that we're going to, we're going to pray. I'm going to have you stand in a moment, but we're going to hear a song that is going to be sung over you as an anthem as you leave. Don't you dare for a second log off. Don't you dare start getting ready to get your kids or get your keys or whatever it might be. Stay. Be still. Let this song encourage you and strengthen you as you get ready to leave and tell somebody. This world needs us. It's a dark place. But the light of Jesus can overcome it all. Let's stand to our feet. Let's pray. And then let's just let this song wash over us today. Father God, we love you. I pray right now that if there's anyone here within the sound of my voice that does not know you, Jesus, that they would contact a, a, a host online, that they would come and pray with one of our pastors and directors up front, that they would make that decision to cross over in, from death into life. Father, for the rest of us, Father, may we be bold in our faith. May we strengthen our relationships with one another, and may we move from the superficial to the spiritual, knowing that it is so important. 
Help us to do that, not by our strength, but by yours. May we remember sin is real. Eternity is real. Jesus, you're real. Grace is real. Salvation is real. May we never forget because there is nothing to be ashamed of in Jesus. In his beautiful name we pray.